nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, good morning. It's good to uh, be back here, I guess, in a place where I'm comfortable and familiar with. I know you, for the most part out there, are probably pretty comfortable where you are too right now and, and in places that you're pretty familiar with. And yet, even though we're separated by distance, we can still be joined together as we worship our God. And that's what we're here this morning for. We just sang about what a beautiful name this name of Jesus is. And it's beautiful because of what it really means to us. It's beautiful because of how he saves us. Last week we looked at that. How what Jesus did on Easter when he rose again saves us from all, for all eternity. And this week, um, today we're going to start a new series. It's called Resilient Faith. And it's about how our faith in this person of Jesus 
helps us bounce back from the trials of life, but also make sense of life and find a purpose and meaning to life that gives us the strength to bounce back and to keep going and to handle what life throws our way. So would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin this morning? Our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we come here this morning to worship you, to turn our hearts to you, to express our adoration, our love for you in our songs and in our prayers, but also to hear your truth from your word about what this all means, how we can make sense of even a difficult situation like we're going through now in our country. So Lord, we just entrust this time to you and we pray that you will work in us through it what is good and pleasing to you. In Christ's name then we pray, amen. I'd just like to welcome you, I guess, and start this time of worship with his assurance to us from his word that he does care for us. God comes to us as he does to all the New Testament uh, church, uh, churches in those letters at the uh, last half of the New Testament when he says, uh, grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this point, I'm going to turn this back over to, uh, to our praise band. grace and love and forgiveness. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling you. Oh, come to Yeah. 
about how sometimes we don't understand what God is doing, but he always has a purpose in what he does. Good morning. Today I wanted to share with you um, a little bit of a devotion that my family had done a few weeks ago, and it talks in that devotion about a Rubik's Cube. And I've played with these, messed around with them a little bit before, and when I do that, I never know how to put it back to where it was. And I really struggle with that, so I usually just put it off to the side. And it kind of got me thinking about what's going on in our world right now. We don't know how to fix all these things. You go to the grocery store and there's things not there. And you can't go to school. And I don't get to go to work. And we can't go to church together. We can't have all these things going on together like what we normally do. And it kind of makes it feel like everything's a mess. But... The one thing that we can all remember is that God knows what's going on. And he can fix all these messes that are going on in our life, all those weird things that we can't control ourselves. He can fix all those things. All we have to do is go to him and talk to him, tell him about those things. And he has a plan. We don't know when he'll fix all those things, but we know he will. And God will put everything right back together the way it should be. I hope you guys are all doing okay. And I hope that we can all get together here again sometime soon. Bye. I never could figure them out either. So, Just a few things before we go to prayer this morning. Some... Uh, Reminders and some updates. Um, we want to keep in mind uh, Hester Barkle at this time. I got word from the family this morning that uh, they are now only allowed to see her through the window again. This week they had been allowed to get in if they were all uh, suited up. Uh, but now because of some uh, new restrictions there, uh, they are not allowed to go in anymore. So now they can only see her through the window. 
she does continue to decline, and uh, so we just want to pray for protection and for that family. We want to remember Tabitha Zarita as there's a baby coming very soon there, so continue to keep her in your prayers. Uh, my wife Nancy has her final treatment this week, Tuesday, and so keep that in your prayers. And also Brad Kalmick, Kate Blaukamp's brother, uh, who suffered the accident with his arm, uh, he has been in a lot of pain this week, and we need to pray for that to be reduced and also for a restoration of uh, movement and function for him. And so let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? Lord, your word says in Psalm 56 that when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Lord, we think about that, and then we think about that song that we know that says sometimes he calms the storm, and other times he calms his child. And Lord, in this time of storm around us, in our country, in our world, in our personal lives, we pray, Lord, that you would calm the storm. But Lord, if that is not your will for us today, we pray that you would send your calm and your peace into your children. We pray for our governmental leaders, those on the, the world stage, those on the national stage, and the state and the local. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom in decisions that are made as to whether to uh, begin to open up our economy again somewhat or to keep restrictions on. We pray for all the healthcare workers and the truck drivers and the first responders and all those essential workers that continue to work. But we also pray for all those that are not able to work right now. Those who are struggling with the unemployment system that is overwhelmed now. So many people trying to get in and be getting frustrated by the process. Lord, we pray for that, that you would give patience with the systems that are in place and that you would cause those systems to work to the best of their ability. And then we think of all the nonprofits and all the other relief organizations that are doing all they can to help those in need. Lord, may we support them with our prayers with our uh, financial assistance and with any other assistance that we can give to them. We think of all the missionaries around the world, those that we support from this congregation. We think especially today of Tabitha Zarita as we know that she has a, a baby due. Her and Marvin and the rest of the family expect a baby any time now. We just pray for your safety, your protection, and your, your uh, delivering of a healthy baby there. We think of Chad and Dara and Nettie and Xenia and, and for their protection there and for the people that they work with. And we also continue to pray for Xenia's adoption. We know, Lord, that Rebecca Larman is back here in this country and missing the students that she had, that she was working with. And Lord, we just pray for her and for them. We think of Lindsay Burton, where she is working. We think of Alan Lisa Gemmon as they are preparing to come back to this area again this summer. And for all the other missionaries that we support here. And we think also of the military folks connected to this congregation as they are spread out in various places and possibly doing things that are different than what they have been doing because of this uh, pandemic right now. And Lord, we want to think of all those who are listed in the bulletin who need your healing hand. We think of Will and Laurel and Ron 
and Nancy and Brad and Mitch and Jim and Peggy and Kim and Betty and Shirley. <clears throat> Lord, as they continue to wait on you for healing and for restoration and, and continue to go th through things in their life that cause concern, Lord, just give them that calm in the storm also. <clears throat> and those who are, who are confined to their, uh, to their homes or their care facilities, we think of Lou and Faye and Wayne and Florence and Emerson and Dolores and Carol and Mary and David and Lloyd and Esther and Wayne and Goldie and Eileen. Lord, they are separated from those that they love. And contact is very limited and sometimes our spirits can get pretty low during those times. Lord, just help them to feel your presence with them. And we pray especially for Hester this morning and her family. Uh, separated, not able to go in at a time like this. Lord, we just pray for your peace through the process. We have been praying for that all week, and you have been answering prayers. She has been peaceful and restful and calm, and we are thankful for that. And just be with her and Aldi and the family. And then we think of Holly and Randy and, and Rachel as they prepare to move on to a new opportunity of ministry in Iowa. Lord, we know that there is much to be done in preparing for that move and packing and finishing teaching online and finishing projects here, but also in beginning to pick up the work in Iowa and connect over there. And Lord, sometimes that can all seem very overwhelming. But Lord, give them that peace through it all. And we pray for our church family here as we uh, adjust and, um, and, and find ourselves uh, in places where uh, we have not been for a while. We pray that you would give wisdom to all involved, the consistory, the committees, and all of us as church members. Give us wisdom for decisions to be made and give us that peace that only you can give. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that for all of us, for all those we have mentioned this morning and for many more that we have not. For all of us as your children of God here in this place, we pray that you would give us that peace that passes all understanding. And may you guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And now we're going to sing together Jesus' firm foundation before Randy opens the word for us. And let that be a reminder for us of how firm a foundation Jesus is in a shaken world. Let's sing together.
We will not be shaken because of our firm foundation. You know, I don't have to tell any of you that things are going bad out there in some ways, that we're going through a time that is difficult for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And yet, we are people who can go through this without being shaken down to our core because of the foundation that we have. And this passage that we're going to look at this morning is one of those that speaks directly to that, directly to why and how we can go through this without being shaken. So without any more uh, for me, let's turn to our, our Bibles to passage uh, Romans 8, and we're going to read verses 17 to 28. There is so much in this passage that there's no way I can unpack all of it in one sermon, and yet I'd like to address how it speaks to us in this time, okay? So um, just beginning with verse 17, kind of picking up on where it had been going. And if we are children, children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility or frustration, some other versions say. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what, we, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, and we know, that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. There's a story about a farmer who got injured in an accident, and he ended up in court. And the opposition's lawyer um, asked him, Sir, didn't you say at the scene of the accident that you were fine? farmer responded, well, I'll tell you what happened. I had just loaded my favorite old mule, Bessie, into the... I didn't ask for any details, the lawyer interrupted. Just answer the question. Did you or did you not say at the time of the accident, I'm fine? Well, the farmer replied, well, I had just got Bessie under that trailer, and I was driving down the highway when this huge... And the lawyer, and the lawyer interrupts again and says, Judge, I'm trying to establish... The fact that at the scene of the accident, this man told the highway patrolman that he was just fine. Now, several weeks later, after the accident, he's trying to sue my client for damages. I believe his claim is fraudulent. Please tell him to simply answer the question. Well, fortunately for the farmer, the judge was interested in hearing more. He said to the lawyer, I'd like to hear what he has to say about Bessie. The farmer thanked the judge and proceeded, well, as I was saying... I had just loaded Bessie into the trailer and was driving her down the highway when this huge semi-truck and trailer ran the stop sign and broadsided my truck. I was thrown into one ditch and Bessie was thrown into another. And I was, I was hurting real bad, but I could hear old Bessie moaning and wheezing off in her ditch. Well, within a few minutes, the highway patrolman came and after he looked over Bessie, he took, over, took out his gun and shot her between the eyes. Then he crossed the road with his gun in his hand and looked at me. I, your mule was in such bad shape, I had to put her down and put her out of her misery. How are you feeling? I'm just fine, I said. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's good reason 
for us not to tell people how we're really feeling when we end up in one of life's ditches. Sometimes we're not sure. We're just, we're not sure what to say. We're not sure if we can trust them. We're, especially if somebody else might have done something that put us in that place. The truth is that all of us wind up in ditches from time to time. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble and no one's immune to it. Some ditches are shallow. Like when you, you, know, you might think you've broken your arm and you find out you only bruised it. I mean, it, may, it might hurt for a while and at the time we might think it's much worse than it is. But at the end, it's not really too much more than an inconvenience and we might be able to bounce back and get through those times just fine just by ourselves. And for some of us, honestly, this coronavirus pandemic will be something like that. Inconvenience, difficult, maybe worse for than we think it's, and we might think it's going to be worse than it is for us. But we'll get through it without too much trouble. But for others, for others it could be something much worse. And some ditches in life are like that. Like when you lose a job, or maybe worse, you lose a business you spent your lifetime building up. Or maybe it's losing a house. Or maybe when someone you love is diagnosed with a disease. Maybe there are other times. Those are the ditches that we can't necessarily climb out of by ourselves. And those are the times we don't just bounce back on our own. These are the times when, yeah, it's so important to have people, to have people who care about you, come alongside of you, hold you up, help you through. And we all know that. But these are also the times when God himself can hold us up, when those who draw near to him can feel his strength. And it's not just an emotional strength, as important as that might be. As these deeper trials wear on, though, we may need something more, something to give us hope, something to give us a bigger perspective that takes us beyond our current struggle. Many of the worldviews out there, quite frankly, offer no explanation, no understanding of why bad things happen. Maybe they just say it's all just random bad luck. It's all just cause and effect between some, you know, things that uh, nobody has control over. Some people might say, oh, it's just karma. You must have done something bad to deserve this. But what's worse is that they don't offer a way through, through the trials. No hope for a better future. No hope for something good that might come out of the struggle and give it some meaning, some value, some purpose even. The Bible never pretends that we won't have trouble. Instead, it addresses it head on right from the beginning. Chapter 3 of the Bible, it's already there. And we've looked before at how the Bible explains why bad things still happen even to good people. Yes, sometimes it is the consequences of mistakes we make ourselves. That's probably where the whole understanding of karma comes from, right? We, we all sin. We all do bad things. They have consequences that can come around, come back to us. But that certainly doesn't explain everything bad. Some of the ditches of life are from things that other people do. Maybe it's from their sin. Nothing we deserved, but yet we end up dealing with it. Sometimes trials come from God's uh, discipline or his teaching. His, God needed to teach us something important. Sometimes we know it can be from God's adversary, the devil, trying to get to us and take us down like we saw last fall. And then sometimes it's just from the effects of sin and the way it has warped this world in which we live. It takes the good things, even of creation, and can turn them into something bad that can do us harm. Maybe you remember uh, the story of a girl named Bethany Hamilton. I was reading about her a couple weeks ago. Um, if you don't remember, uh, Bethany was a world-class surfer at age 13, and she just signed her first professional endorsement. She had a bright future ahead of her, and then she lost her left arm when a 15-foot tiger shark attacked her while she was on her surfboard. Can you imagine the shock, the pain, not just physically but emotionally, of what that would mean to a 13-year-old girl looking at her future? It's one of those tragedies that, honestly, if it happened to you, if it happened to me, 
we might think, man, there's, there's no good that can come out of any of this. And these types of trials can be the hardest ones to understand at the time. And even, even when we look back afterwards, because, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's any direct lesson to be learned. Like with God's discipline, you know, maybe there's a direct lesson there sometimes. Or maybe there's, there's no malevolent cause like the oppression from other people or the devil. These things happen, and we ask why. Or as Bethany Hamilton says that she asked for a long time, how can this be part of God's plan for me? And yet we need to go back to the beginning and remember that there was a time when things like this did not happen. You see, it wasn't always this way. Back in the beginning, God created the earth and everything in it, and God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very, very good. But when Adam and Eve rebelled against God by directly disobeying what he told them, this paradise-ripping effects of that sin went far beyond just the two of them, even beyond the race of humanity. For God said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for, me, for you. And the curse, of course, went beyond just the ground itself. For as the Belgic Confession summarizes some of our faith very succinctly, it says, this is a corruption of all nature that happened. Sin, sin itself, man, sometimes sin is compared to a virus. It, it's a virus that can invade a body and cause it not to work right and cause it pain. It's like a virus that gets passed from one person to another person until its effects spread around the whole world. From now on until Christ returns, we will have to cope with the effects of sin on us as humans and on the natural world around us in which we live. It affects everything. Romans 8 told us that creation was subjected to futility or frustration and bondage to corruption. That's what it's talking about. Isaiah 24 verse 20 put it this way. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. Well, great. Is that the end of the story though? that we're forever condemned to simply endure the effects of sin in this life? No. No, it's not. Part of our answer, though, is that Bethel and Hamilton's story is a, it's something like the story of Joseph in the Bible. Back in Genesis 28, it's, there's this difficult story about how Joseph finds himself not at the bottom of a ditch, but at the bottom of a well because his brothers threw him in there because they were jealous of their father's attention to him. Now he favored him. And when Joseph got up out of that well, he, things got even worse when his brothers human trafficked him into slavery. And like Bethany Hamilton, Joseph was probably a teenager when this happened. Doesn't understand it. And yet he's faced with the enduring effects of somebody else's sins. And soon he's headed south into Egypt and into slavery for a long time. Probably thought his life was as good as over. It looked pretty hopeless from there. Probably thought he would never be free again, never see his family again, never be able to even speak his native language again with other people. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. And Joseph got more, of his share, more than his share of it. But fast forward 30 years, and Joseph is prime minister of Egypt. Second richest, second most powerful man in the world. No longer taking orders from a master. He is the master of an empire got a wife, he's got children, his extended family's been reunited with him. He's their hero. He saved their lives, he saved his father's life. He saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people through God leading him in his role as that prime minister. God put him there for a purpose. And one day though, later on, after his father dies, those brothers come to him and say, hey Joseph, now that dad's gone, what's going to happen? Can you forgive us for what we did to you? three decades ago. Listen carefully to Joseph's response. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Yeah, his brothers had sinned, and their sin affected Joseph dramatically. But during that time as slave, Joseph had learned a lot, and he had committed his life to God, and God had brought something very good out of that tragedy. 
Isaiah 55 gives us a, a kind of a bigger picture frame to put this in. It says, well, God tells us, for, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We were made in God's image, so yeah, we are like God in some ways, but in his thinking, God is far above us. You know, we tend to think about what we don't have. God thinks about what he'd like to give us. We think about our present disappointments. God thinks about what's best for our future. We think about what, what can't happen or won't happen or didn't happen or couldn't happen. And God thinks about making good things come out of even life's tragedies. Joseph was in a situation where he probably thought that no good could come out of it. And yet, great good comes out of it. Because God's ways are higher than our ways. After her tragedy, Bethany Hamilton wrestled mightily with what good could possibly come out of being attacked by a shark. Yet through it all, she held on to this verse from the end of our passage. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That can be really hard to see when we're in the middle of it. But today she can look back and see how God used her life, her tragedy in a powerful way. She didn't turn away from God and he gave her strength to get through it. Within a year, she was back surfing again, winning titles on the surfing circuit. She released a movie back then, a few years after that, called Soul Surfer. Maybe you remember that if you're old enough. And that movie touched many people's lives. Her story touched many people's lives about how her faith helped her get through a tragedy like that to a young girl. You know, some people might think, yeah, okay, Christianity, sure. It was good for me too when I was a little kid. But life's more complicated now. It doesn't work for me anymore. Well, here's the thing. As we grow, and as we see more of the complexity of life, we, the more we're also going to see the dark side of it. Yeah, maybe when we were little, we got the impression that if we're Christian, everything's going to work out right for us, and that God won't... Uh, won't let us experience any pain as we go through life. Okay. Yeah, sometimes maybe we oversimplify things in Sunday school or vacation Bible school stories. Oversimplify them and people, kids especially, don't, we don't get into the pain of life with young children. And a Sunday school of faith, though, probably isn't going to get us through the harsh times of life. But Christianity goes a whole lot deeper than that. Like we've been talking about. You see, when we stick with it and keep growing with it, we find that God helps us find meaning and hope and purpose, even in the struggles, even in the worst of this life. Because it creates us with the, it connects us, I mean, with the creator of life. The one who gave this life its purpose. That's what Christianity does. Keeps us close to this God. For Bethany Hamilton, yeah, she's uh, 30 years old now, married, couple kids. And yet she too continues to find her hope and her purpose in Jesus Christ. And like Joseph, she too has seen God's faithfulness to her for her through these past 17 years. What brought her to my attention again, though, you see, is that she was recently the subject of another movie, a documentary, documentary titled Unstoppable. And it speaks about how resilient, how she has been able to not just bounce back, but become more than she ever was before, even though she's missing an arm. She just announced last month that she's going to be competing in the World Surf League Qualifying Series with the goal of qualifying for the World Surf League Championship in 2021. 
You see, for 17 years now, God has been using her life story to reach and encourage people around the world. And friends, if you're in a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ and have been called according to his purpose, he will work all things for your good if you let him, if you work with him, if you learn what he has to teach you through the trials. Yes, it will take time. And it might not seem like you're getting through the trial as quickly as you like because time, time seems to stand still when we're in the middle of trials like that. But this is God's promise. He will work all things together for good of those who love him. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 tells us that he has made everything beautiful in his time. Yet he has also set eternity in the hearts of men. They cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. That's not a Sunday school verse. That's a grown up verse. You know, we're finite. We are limited in our capacities and what we can do and in what we can comprehend. None of us can fully fathom God or his ways or his plans. But he is the God who can make everything beautiful in his timing. So sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances that defy hope. Our ditch is so stinking deep that it comes, that it seems like there's, there's no way we're ever going to be able to climb out of it and bounce back. But God has higher thoughts than we do. He works things for the good of those who love him. His timing took 30 years for Joseph. To us, God's timing moves so slowly sometimes. So why is that? Why? You know, maybe we'll never know for sure, but maybe it's because of the material he has to work with. And let's admit it, all, all, of the, all the heroes in the Bible needed work. So do you and I. Joseph, Joseph taunted his older brothers about them bowing down to him. Man, he needed to work on his pride. Other great people in the Bible needed a lot of work too. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David. Major flaws in their characters at times. Most of the people whose lives made the biggest impact, though, experienced this truth that God worked through their tragedies and worked on their character for a long time before they were the type of people who could make that kind of difference. Some of you may have thought in the middle of your despair at times that your life was as good as over, or you wonder what good can come of it. Verses 26 and 27 of our passage speak to us here. Like the Spirit helps us in our weakness, or likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart's knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. When we draw close to God, He speaks to us through His Spirit to help us understand what we need to understand, or at least in the short run to give us the peace and the assurance and the strength that we need to just make it through one more day. And yet for God to work all things together for our good, sometimes that means teaching us the hardest lessons about ourselves. You may have had or made serious mistakes in life and had to endure the consequences of those or other forms of God's discipline. And at the time, you may have thought that no good would come out of it. But as Hebrews 11, verse 12, or 12 verse 11 says, yeah, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's what happens when we work with God through the trials. When we draw close to him and listen to that spirit's whisper in our hearts, helping us to understand the purpose and meaning in, that can come out of our trials. I love this passage because it, you've got the whole trinity in this passage. You've got the working of the spirit. You've got God the Father. You've got our connection with Jesus Christ. 
You see, when we draw close to God in our pain, God has our full attention and he helps us to see and even address things that we might never have let him fix otherwise. And maybe like Bethany Hamilton, to do things for us that he never could have done otherwise. Even accomplishing immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Sometimes, like with Bethany, he uses our struggles to help others. Probably won't get a movie <laughs> made about our lives, okay? But you never know who's watching, who may see not only how God helped us through a difficult time, but they may even see what God did within us, what he brought about in us through that trial. And there's even more, really, that this passage offers. Verse 21 speaks of the greatest hope and the greatest reward that is yet to come. Of the time when the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There will be a time when this earth is restored back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden, when everything was good and it will be again. And all of the effects, all of the stuff that we have to deal with related to sin will be gone. And we will be restored too. None of the bad in this life and all of the best of this life and so much more that that too is beyond our ability to comprehend. For those who persevere in faith, all of our trials will be more than made up for, this passage says. While we can't see or understand the meaning of now, we will understand then how God worked through it. That speaks of who God is. He is the God whose ways are higher than our ways. He's the God who is working for the good of those who love him. He is the God who makes things beautiful in his time. And that's how God makes us as a people who can bounce back from anything that life can throw at us. How we become resilient because of this faith that we have in this God. He helps us to know that there can be a purpose and meaning and something good that can come out of even the worst of it if we're willing to work with him through it. And even when we're stuck knee-deep in the manure of this life and can't see beyond the struggle that we're in, his spirit whispers to our soul and gives us what we need for each day just to keep wading through it. You see, life isn't measured by the outcome of a moment or of one event or one season. And really good lives, like really good books and really good stories, they have plot twists. Great lives overcome great adversity. Who wants to read about a guy who was born into a perfect family, led a charmed life, married a perfect woman, had 2.3 perfect kids, and died rich and happy at an old age? Well, good for him, you know? The story doesn't sell, though, because it doesn't speak to us. It doesn't have anything to help us, anything that can work for us. You see, Jesus knows about struggles. His ministry was full of of misunderstanding, false accusation, rejection, betrayal. And then he literally went through hell for us. And his is the greatest story ever told. The stories of his people are often reflections of him in some way. Think about it. Aren't the stories of the people that we learn the most from and that are encouraging us the most, aren't they the ones where the people also went through troubles but could also bounce back from some great trial? Over the last four years, I've heard a lot of stories of the lives of the people in this church. Trials from health problems, from children, parents, work, from the mistakes we've all made, from accidents that have happened, even some betrayals. And yet I'm encouraged by the strength and the conviction and the courage and the depth of faith that God has brought out of pretty normal people. None of it has come easy. But when drawing close to God through it, it has produced and is still producing something beautiful in us in his time. So just for a current example, what good can God bring out of this whole COVID-19 thing? Not for us to know probably right now. But it'll probably come from your stories. Yes, it's going to come at a cost. The cost has been high. 
But let's not let this go to waste. Maybe it's the things we're forced to learn about ourselves as we handle this time of stress and frustration of having to change our lifestyles and probably enduring some loss ourselves. Maybe it will be from the new to restored relationships with our families that we've had to work out from spending so much time together. Maybe it'll be refocusing on the important things of life because a lot of that other stuff just isn't available to us right now. Maybe it's the other things we've talked about over the last month, but maybe it will be also learning how to pull together as a church, understanding our identity as a church, even as a church goes through transition, learning how much we can learn from people of other generations, how much they have to offer us from what they've been through. When we can learn from older generations about the struggles that they've been through and how they got through them. When we can learn from younger people about what it means to go through this stuff for them today. It's learning how important it is to have the support and encouragement of others. To be those people who make something good out of this by leaning into God and leaning into His Spirit and watching where He takes us through it all as we trust in Him. For we know that God works all things for good for those who love Him. Let's take a moment to pray. Our Father, we thank You for these words to hold on to. This assurance that You give us that there is something good that can come out of even the worst. And Lord, even if we don't see it at the time, help us to trust that there will be meaning and purpose that comes out of all this. Lord, we just put this into your hands. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Our next song just speaks to us about what kind of solidity and foundation that this faith can give us in life. It's called the solid rock. Let's stand and sing. Well, for those of you who are at home, go ahead and stand if you want to, or just stay sitting on your couch. I don't care, but just sing along with us.
I'd just like to leave you with a couple last words. I referred to them a little bit earlier in the passage, in the message, but it's from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.